Uh, okay. Hi everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, now uh, we are yes, we are ready. Uh, we, are, we are ready to start. And uh, you know, um, welcome to this uh, uh, webinar series of the European Society of Biomechanics. Um, today we have the great pleasure to host a webinar about machine learning uh, in cardiovascular mechanics, uh, conducted by the assistant professor Matthias Birlink. And thank you for accepting the invitation, Matthias. Mm, then um, uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm Gianluca and I'm a research fellow at uh, Sapienza University of Rome. And uh, together with Laura, uh, which is a PhD candidate at KU Leven in Belgium, uh, we support the organization of ESB webinars within uh, the activities of the ESB student committee. Um, all the webinars are uploaded on our YouTube channel, where you can find many other videos, such as recordings of the journal club sessions, uh, award presentations, and plenary lectures. And uh, we encourage all of you to subscribe to get to know more of the society activities. And please uh, feel free to leave any comments or suggestions for the next webinar topics. So now we are ready to start, and it's a great honor to introduce you, Matthias Pirlink. Uh, he's an assistant professor of biomechanical engineering at Delft University of Technology. Uh, he received his PhD in biomedical engineering from Ghent University and worked uh, as a postdoc researcher at Stanford University. His lab's research focuses uh, on the integration of physics-based modeling and machine learning techniques to understand the multiscale behavior of the human heart. Uh, Mattia received uh, several awards and prizes, uh, including the Marie Curie Seal of Excellence in 2019, the PhD prize at Ghent in 2022, and the Dutch Science Foundation Many Talent Award last year. Uh, the presentation will last 45 minutes, and uh, then uh, there will be uh, 10 minutes of QA sessions. Uh, so, Either during or after the talk, please uh, type uh, your curiosities uh, in the question box or in the chat. Now let's start and uh, welcome Matthias. The, the stage is yours. Okay. All right. Thank you, Laura and Gianluca, for your kind invitation. Uh, and welcome everyone to today's talk. So today I will be talking about um, physics-based modeling and machine learning synergies in human heart modeling. Um, I have I will share a couple of works together with you, but also will give you a bit more insight into some of the machine learning techniques or data-driven modeling techniques we have been using uh, in the over the last couple of years. Uh, I have many people to acknowledge in this work, but I want to give a specific shout out to Francisco Sali Costaval, professor at the University Católica de Chile, Universidad Católica de Chile, and Alan Poole, professor at Stanford University, who were my uh, collaborators on the two specific studies I will focus on uh, the most today. Um, so, human heart modeling. Um, well, I th think it does not come to a surprise uh, to anyone of the European Society of Biomechanics that heart disease is actually the world's number one killer. If you look at the amount of people that die from heart disease per year, uh, that is more than the amount of people dying from cancer, respiratory diseases, and HIV combined. So it's very understand, uh, very important for us to, uh, under to develop tools to better understand and combat heart disease. And the main tool that uh, many of us are working on uh, to accomplish this is developing cardiac digital twins. So cardiac digital twin, uh, what do I mean with that? So I'm an engineer. So as an engineer, if I want to better understand the heart, what I do is that I try to uh, approach the heart and its behavior as uh, the solution to a multi-scale, multi-physics based problem. And so what do I mean with multi-scale? Well, that's both spatially and temporally. Uh, spatially, you can think of um, the different scales that are important for the heart. So there's processes taking place at the subcellular scale, cellular scale, tissue scale, organ scale, body scale, and even population level. Uh, and we need to map those out, express them as physics-based problems that we can compute. And then these physics itself uh, can be are various uh, kinds of physics in the heart. So there's electrophysiology, which is important in the heart, there's tissue mechanics, fluid mechanics, 
core time modeling and imaging physics all coming together if we want to understand the heart better. So these physics specifically, um, well, if we look at electrophysiology, for example, the subtitle nature uh, of the ion channel is important in leading to an action potential. So we have to map out the amounts of ions going in and out of the cell to understand how the cardiomyocyte depolarizes and repolarizes. And then we can bring that up to the tissue uh, scale by solving a reaction diffusion problem to understand what the spatial temporal evolution of this transmembrane potential is. And we do that by solving uh, basically ODEs and PDEs together. So we can understand how the electrical signal basically travels through the tissue and how it travels faster along the my cardiomyocyte direction uh, and in the other directions as well. And then we can integrate this all together in an organ scale model in, in which we take into account the GD geometry of the patient's heart, the tissue heterogeneity, so all the different cell types that are in there, and the anisotropy. So that gives us the physics of electrophysiology, then that drives mechanics. So there, the multiscale nature, we start at the cell scale. The calcium release within the cardiomyocyte leads to contractile uh, forces being built up, and that's something we can express using a time varying elastance function. We can integrate that together with the passive mechanical behavior of cardiac tissue at the tissue scale. And then again, integrate this all into patient specific geometries where we take into account tissue heterogeneity and anisotropy again. And then the last physics I will give some more insight into is then the fluid mechanics because that's the main function of course of the heart to pump oxygen rich blood towards the, the system, to, towards your whole, your whole body basically, and also to assess oxygen for uh, blood to the lungs so that they can get oxygenated. So if we want to understand in high detail how blood is flowing through the heart, we can do that by solving fluid structure interaction problems. Or if we uh, want to understand uh, in a simpler way how blood is being sent throughout the body, we can also solve lung parameter networks, for example, to understand uh, how the hemodynamics are affecting the heart and vice versa. So if we do that, eventually we come to this, so we can solve the electrophysiology on these domains. We can use this to uh, activate the mechanics so that we can understand the stretches and the stresses within the tissue, as you can see here. And then depending on what we're looking at, we can further couple this to high uh, fidelity fluid structure interaction simulations so we can understand how blood flows, flows through the atria and through the ventricles towards the rest of the circulation. So why do we do this? Maybe first, that's important also for you all to understand because it provides a lot of opportunities. So for medical device innovation, I'm going to give you some examples. For example, we can use these, these models, these highly realistic uh, virtual models of the human heart and its behavior to better understand mechanical fatigue, for example, of pacemaker leads, which unfortunately, unfortunately still is a problem. We can use that to quantify uh, measurements that we cannot easily uh, collect experimentally. For example, if manufacturers want to develop the microclip, which is a device that basically takes these two leaflets and holds them together. They need to understand forces that that device has to endure. And uh, that is something we can get from these models. Similarly, we can use this to uh, understand uh, how micro valve designs will be behaving, or even if we have wild ideas for new designs for analopathy rings, for example, we can first virtually um, design them, optimize them before we actually make the first prototype. Secondly, uh, these human heart models are also quite interesting for personalized treatment strategies. I, there's a whole ton of examples out there in the literature, but I want to give you two specific examples uh, that uh, we are involved in as well. So, for example, uh, what is it useful for is, for example, with congenital heart disease patients, together with Matteo Salvador from Stanford University, we are working on understanding what the optimized pacing would be for these highly challenging patient populations. And we can do that using physics-based models, uh, such as the ones I have shown you before. And also another nice example of this is that can we use these models to better understand the amount of radiation we need to visual, uh, visualize basically plugs in patient-specific uh, geometries or patient-specific um, body uh, compositions, I would say. So depending on your body composition, um, we can understand how much radiation you would need and also actually optimize the amount of radiation we would need to still see plaques, which is what you want to pick up, but still to minimize the amount of radiation. 
Uh, a third uh, important reason for developing these uh, art models, of course, is regulatory verification so that we can speed up the R&D cycle for new devices and treatment strategies to end up uh, in the clinics, for example. Today, such a, if we think of a new device, for example, it takes years before such a device is really tested in a realistic human environment. But with these cardiac digital twins, what we can do is speed up that process and basically in a couple of days already realistically understand how such a device and its prototype would work in a realistic human environment before we actually start making prototypes and really test them out in animal and clinical trials. Lastly, uh, I think what is also most important for us in the lab is that we use these models to have an improved understanding of cardiac physiology and cardiac pathophysiology. And some examples uh, of that are, for example, that we try to understand the cardiac response to chronic overloading and development of heart failure, basically. I will give some more insight into that with a specific example later on. Similarly, we uh, use these models to uh, quantify sex differences in cardiac mechanics and electrophysiology, which is important to improve um, the amount, the, the diagnosis and the treatment therapies for both men and women. And then uh, another example is also that we can use these models to better understand how drugs impact the heart and how they can actually modulate the performance of the heart. For a nice overview of all these different opportunities, I would love to refer you to this review paper that you can find here, very nicely summarize all the opportunities that Cardiac Digital Twin Technology has. Uh, and I think it can be quite informative for uh, people who are jumping into this field uh, right now or want to understand better what this is, uh, what the impact of these technologies is. However, going to the topic of today's talk, well, what, you, what I showed you is the result of physics-based models. So what that basically uh, means is that we understand the physics. And that's fine for an average human heart, as you can see here, where we basically have a ton of data on the subcellular processes, cellular tissue, organ, population level, body scale, if we have a ton of data of that, we can translate that into physical laws and we uh, can basically use lots of physics and a small amount of data, in this case, for example, the geometry and some pressure volume relationships to develop a digital replica of your heart. However, in a lot of uh, situations, we don't always know the physics or we have no understanding of the physics. And then big data or data-driven modeling techniques are the other opportunities we have to better understand systems. However, in biomechanics or bio computational biophysics, I would say we are often somewhere in the middle. So we have some understanding of the physics and we have some data, uh, not as much of each as we would love to, but we, that's basically what we have to deal with. And I like to think of these, the spectrum as sort of the spectrum between Isaac Newton and Thomas Bayes. And therefore, for, I like to Call the next section of my talk when Isaac Newton meets Thomas Bayes. So the question basically is how can we efficiently make use of some physics and some data? How can we efficiently combine that? And we do that by combining machine learning with physics-based modeling. Machine learning has its strength in correlation. So with machine learning what we can do is that we can use data to infer theory. However, we cannot just blindly use machine learning because we have often have limited data and some uncertainty on the data that we collected, for example, in human heart modeling. Uh, that's, of course, the case but in many other uh, topics that are valid for this community. That's the case as well. On the other hand, with physics-based modeling, so physics-based modeling has a strength in causality. We can use physics to predict theory. However, we don't always know the physics uh, properly, or even if we do, we don't always know the parameters properly. So what I want to focus the rest of the talk uh, on is how can we leverage synergies between causality from physics-based modeling and correlation power of machine learning. I'm doing that by uh, going into depth uh, with these two papers, but I will give you uh, more insight into the machine learning techniques that we have used and how they specifically work for those of you who have never seen that before. So starting with this first paper, using machine learning to characterize heart failure across scales, from that title, you can see that we want to better understand heart failure development and progression. So we want to understand why, for example, if you have an aortic stenosis that the heart starts thickening uh, and you have this kind of failure, for example. On the other side, uh, if we have mitral regurgitation and volume overload, we see eccentric hypertrophy 
um, and we want to understand also why that is the case. So we try to understand that by turning it into physics-based equations. And so we want to understand the heart from multi-scale perspective as a multi-scale system. So for example, if you have a leaky valve here, what you get is that this uh, ventricular tissue in the left ventricle, for example, is overloaded. That leads to uh, different mechanical loading that is felt all across the scales. And then at the subcellular scale, that actually starts uh, some progresses or processes that change the, the, constitu the constituents within the tissue, which is then felt back all the way at the organ scale. And so this is a feedback loop that is continuously taking place and evolving over time. So a nice framework for us to actually bring this into a mathematical environment or framework is the kinematic-based growth framework. However, importantly in the kinematic-based growth framework is the definition of this growth deformation tensor, Fg. What we assume is that this is based on mechanical stimuli. However, if you look into the literature for which mechanical stimuli are actually leading to this remodeling and growth processes, you can find a whole ton of different proposals by different authors of how certain strains, stresses, uh, strain energy potentials, for example, at different time points in the cardiac cycle leads to these processes. And it's not surprising that there's so many ideas on this. Uh, the problem there is basically it's not easy to validate these, these laws. Why is that? Well, that's because um, there's a highly patient-specific time course and extent of disease progression with heart failure. So basically, when you propose a new law, you have to go look at different subjects and really follow them specifically. Then there's a multi-scale nature of cardiac growth and remodeling. So you have to uh, basically collect data at different scales, so cell scale and organ scale, for example. And even if you collect these experimental data, there's still noise or uncertainty on the data itself. So these three challenges make this really uh, difficult uh, to validate such a law. But that didn't stop us. So we went ahead and we had access to a very nice long, uh, longitudinal animal heart failure study. So we had six sticks in which we induced systolic heart failure by creating mitral valve regurgitation, and that will cause cardiac growth and modeling. And what we did is that we both computationally and experimentally quantified cell and organ scale changes. So experimentally, that's of course our ground truth. And the computer models there, we actually can plug in one of these uh, growth laws and check how well they predict the actual experimental results. So there's some challenges in doing this. Experiments, I mentioned to you, intrinsic uncertainty of experimental data. So how do we deal with that? And now I'm going closer to these data-driven modeling techniques. So what we used here is Bayesian inference combined with hierarchical models. So for those of you who don't know Bayesian inference, well, Bayesian inference gets its name from Thomas Bayes, who was an English statistician and philosopher in the 1700s. And the Bayes theorem basically describes the probability of a hypothesis or a parameter set theta based on prior knowledge, knowledge and observed evidence. So this theorem translates into this equation. And this equation has four um, elements. The first one in blue here is the posterior distribution. And the posterior distribution basically gives you the prob probability of a certain hypothesis that can be one of our, our laws, basically, or a parameter set data that is connected to such a law, given the evidence X or your data X, basically. In yellow, you have your prior distribution, which uh, can quantify the initial beliefs you have about that hypothesis or that parameter set data. Sometimes you have them, sometimes you don't, and then you make this minimally informative. But it allows you to basically pl plug that in there if you have some way of already informing those uh, hypotheses or parameter sets. Then green, importantly, is the likelihood. So that's the probability of your evidence or your uh, parameter set, uh, no, sorry, of your evidence or your data X uh, arising from your hypothesis or your parameter set data. And then lastly, in the denominator, you have your evidence. So that's just the probability of your evidence or your data X arriving globally. So what we are after with Bayesian inference is basically the posterior distribution. We want to understand the probability of our, our hypothesis or our parameter set theta given the evidence X. So there's different ways of computing the posterior distribution depending on your likelihood this, uh, function and your probability distribution of your prior. Uh, this can be done analytically. Very often that's not the case. And now we have to uh, rely on different techniques 
such as Monte Carlo methods, smart chain Monte Carlo, approximate Bayesian computation, variational inference techniques. There's different uh, techniques out there. Uh, until uh, uh, for the two works that I will cover today, we, we focus a lot on Markov Chain Monte Carlo. And so for those of you who don't know what Markov Chain Monte Carlo is, I'll try to explain it to you uh, schematically. So you hear Monte Carlo in Markov Chain Monte Carlo. So Monte Carlo is independent sampling, basically. So you start with a, a parameter as, as theta 1, theta 2, theta 3. You just keep sampling independently from the previous sample. And eventually, you get the distribution of uh, thetas, so basically parameters. That's the distribution on its own. Markov chain, basically, uh, what is important there is that you your next sample depends on the previous sample, so it's no longer independent. So what you have, theta 2 depends on theta 1, theta 3 depends on theta 2, and so on. And the goal with the Markov chain is that this evolves towards a stationary distribution. So what do we do with Markov chain Monte Carlo? We engineer a Markov chain whose stationary distribution is the posterior distribution we're looking for. Again, schematically, what does this look like? We start from theta 1, we look for a new sample, theta 2, we first do Monte Carlo, so we independently sample a new sample, and then we're going to look at theta 1 and theta 2 together. And dependent on a certain uh, cutoff or a certain decision uh, algorithm, we accept or we re reject that sample. So here, for example, we reject. We look for another theta 2 randomly. We look at the, the, uh, whether or not it fits. And we keep repeating that till we find a theta 2 that we're happy with. Again, we do this for finding theta 3. Reject, accept, reject, accept. And eventually, the goal is that you keep repeating this until you come to this theta 1 star and the whole collection, basically, of all the theta stars. And so this is the Markov chain Monte Carlo at work. This first uh, set of parameters you find is called the Vernon phase. And then uh, after the Vernon phase, you really start to find your posterior distribution. So those samples all make sense given your, um, your evidence uh, that you have or your data that you have. So then the question is, how do you decide whether to accept or reject a certain sample? And there's a whole ton of algorithms out there, the one more complex than the other. So just to give you a flavor of how this works, I'm going to uh, give you a simple example, which is the random walk metropolitan tastings method. And so basically, you compare the posterior distribution of a new sample versus a previous sample. You compute them using Bayes' theorem. And once, if this probability is higher than one, you definitely accept. However, if it's lower than one, you don't just reject, but you reject with a certain probability so that you can still explore your parameter space optimally, and you will still find uh, samples that are uh, also not super likely, but still will lead you to your uh, stationary states. So this way, uh, what happens, this is again, uh, explaining this with uh, a nice animation. Every time it, you see a red arrow, a sample was rejected. Every time you see a green one, it is accepted. If you keep repeating this long enough, you find the underlying blue posterior distribution, as you can see here, so that you can get this two-dimensional posterior distribution that you see here. So that was Bayesian inference and uh, a, a technique to find your posterior distribution. I also mentioned to you hierarchical modeling. So hierarchical modeling uh, actually makes use of the hierarchy of your data. And I'll give you an example of what I mean with that. But so a large share of our data can be thought of as hierarchical and we can use proper modeling to make the most of that data. And that's important also here. So think of a hypothetical case where you have a certain genetic condition affecting multiple subjects. And what that genetic condition leads to is that, for example, the, their arterial tissue gets uh, stiffer, for example, which can be problematic. Uh, well, what you have then is that you have this group of, of subjects who all, all have this condition. And for each, each subject, you have multiple experiments. You have multiple arterial tissue samples, for example. The question is, what are you going to learn from that data? So you can first think of just finding one set of parameters describing that tissue for all subjects and all samples. However, then you're throwing away quite some data and some hierarchy of your data, and you're actually underfitting. On the other hand, you can also have independent sample models where you just fit a, a set of parameters for each subject and for all samples. But then you're really overfitting because what, what do you learn from all these um, samples or these parameter sets? 
hierarchical modeling sits in between. So what you do is you still find one set of parameters per subject and per sample, which should take into account other step subjects and samples in finding the relationship between all those uh, parameter sets. So again, schematically, what does this look like? You have different experiments for one subject. This is the hierarchy of your data. All those subjects, again, have hierarchically belong to a hyper condition, as you can see here, this genetic condition, and that is the hierarchy of your data you take it into account when finding parameters. You can then even compare this to another genetic condition. And what is important with doing hierarchical modeling is it helps you reduce the lower level parameter sensitivity to noise, and it helps you identify the variability within subjects and populations and also between them. So now, back to actually our problem. So we have this experimental data collected on these pigs in which we induced heart fear. Um, and what you can see here is a classical example of uh, variability and uncertainty in experimental data. So we had biopsy samples taken every two weeks. We collected myocyte length and myocyte width data. And this is the result. So some pigs we have a lot of data, other pigs some weeks we didn't really have data, or we have some mixed data. What can we do with this? So what we do is that we make use of the hierarchy of the data. So each sample, so basically each cardiomyocyte that we look at is the lowest level hierarchy. So that's one sample. All these slices belong to one pig in which we assume a certain evolution over time that we want to learn. And then all these pigs also have in common that they all underwent the same surgery. So there's also even a hyper distribution on top of them, which explains the hierarchy of the data. By actually then first assuming these prior distribution and then training these posterior distributions within this hierarchy on the data, what we found is this. And this is way more useful for us. So you can see here the confidence intervals of uh, the data for different pigs. You can see that actually by making use of the hierarchy for, for example, pig five, where we didn't have much data, we can still make use of the other pigs to understand what the most likely regions uh, or confidence intervals are. And that can actually help us explain that here through these pigs, we see myocyte lengthening over time in different amounts for these different pigs, and we see barely any changes in the myocyte. Rate. So this is how we quantify the uncertainty in our experimental results. Next, we have our computer models. And as most of you know, computer models are physics. Physics have input parameters. We can solve the physics and we get the deterministic answer. So that's also what we have here. So we have our multi-scale cardiac growth modeling framework. We put in a certain hypothesis. In this case, we took one of the simplest growth laws out there. So we assumed stretch-driven lengthening of the cardiomyocyte and no thickening. And then we can propagate that through our model. So we basically have that for each pig, we have the different geometries. We have a different average volume overload, for example, and we can simulate how these uh, pigs' hearts remodel over time. So that's what you can see here. However, I made a, a, a note there that I said we know the average volume change over time. But again, that's based on experimental uh, data. And again, you have uncertainty on these. So what we could do is again use Bayesian inference and hierarchical modeling to understand the uncertainty even on the input of our model, which is the volumetric overload. And by doing the same as I told you before, we can quantify the uncertainty that we have actually on the volume overload, which is an input to our model. Now, of course, what you then want to be able to do is propagate the uncertainty on your input to your computational model, so that you also quantify the uncertainty on your output. So you no longer have just a deterministic uh, side of your predictions, but uh, uh, actual prediction taking into account the uncertainty that you have. So we have to propagate that uncertainty. And ways to do that is using surrogate modeling, if, if this is computationally too, uh, too limiting, for example. And what we use here is Gaussian process regression. So Gaussian process regression is, again, the type more didactic slide. So Gaussian process, what is our goal with a surrogate model typically is that you have a data set D, so that can be X, Y. So here, what you can typically think of is X is your input, Y is your output. And you want to find a predictive function y is f function of x plus some sort of uncertainty. So what you typically try to do with a deterministic model is solve this, right? You try to understand the relationship or your, your physics-based model helps you solve this, this function f. 
With a Gaussian uh, progress regression, you, you surrogate this, so a Gaussian process in itself can be seen as a probability distribution over possible functions that fit a set of points. And so you start with a prior, think back about Bayesian inference that I told you before. However, now our prior is basically a set of functions. So all random functions, your kernel here describes what these functions look like, how they behave, and uh, there's these parameters data that also uh, have an effect on what this looks like. And what you do is that you condition the, this prior based on your observations. So this, this, these dots are basically points where we know X and we know Y. So we can put that in there and we can learn a Gaussian posterior. So use Bayesian inference again to basically learn the kernel with its hyperparameters theta that makes sense with the XY uh, parameter sets, uh, no, XY data sets that we have. So we train theta to maximize the marginal likelihood of the data, as you can see here. So we did that here. So instead of running almost like 1,000 samples for each pick for each specific volume overload combination that's out there, we smartly sampled within this distribution of volume overloads. We trained uh, for each pick a Gaussian process regression based on 20 high-fidelity physics-based simulations. Um, this is the Gaussian process we train. Always if you train a surrogate model, you of course have to validate that it works well. So we did that with 10 independent samples within that range again, and we make sure that these predictions were working well. So doing this, we can propagate the uncertainty of volumetric overload on our computational predictions. And you can see the result of that here. So in blue, you see the simulation results. So you can see for quite some picks, we have nice overlap for this simplistic stretch-driven growth law. For some picks, we did not. And you can see that even better at growth at week eight. So this is the simulation versus uh, experimental results. Uh, but what's most important here in the study, I would say, is that we, for the first time, as far as I know, really quantified the uncertainty uh, on a, a specific cardiovascular growth law and how that impacts the results and how that actually matches with also the uncertainty on the experimental data. So that was all possible because of these data-driven modeling techniques that we combined with physics-based modeling. Then secondly, another example of how we can leverage synergies between physics-based modeling and machine learning is focused on the second study where we focused on sex differences in drug-induced erythmogenesis. So first, some backgrounds. Uh, for those of you who don't know this, actually any drug we take has an effect on the heart. They affect cells, and for certain specific drugs, what can happen is that you get problems for the electrophysiological um, situation of your heart, basically. So there are some drugs out there which can lead to erythmogenesis, so you basically get uh, some problems in the conduction or like it's not nicely synchronized anymore. And this is something we can explain with physics-based models. Uh, for example, uh, you have this multi-scale impact uh, of how a change for in an ion channel, which is typically what a drug does, can lead to changes all the way up to the organ scale. As an example, for example, uh, for, sorry, as an example, we have clofetalide, which is a drug that's typically used for atrial fibrillation. And the way that it impacts cardiomyocytes is that it actually has a blocking effect on one specific ion channel. So the IKR is the rapid delayed rectifier ion channel. And what you see with higher concentration of drugs is that ion channel gets, gets blocked. And what happens at certain critical concentrations of blocking is that you don't have this normal depolarization and repolarization anymore, but you start seeing early after depolarizations. And those can be risky. They're not always risky, um, but they can be dangerous at the organ scale. And I'll explain that later. So for each of the different cell types within the heart, you can see the effect of that drug here based on physics-based simulations. And if we then integrate that further all the way up to the organ scale, you can see that at certain critical concentration, for example, here 5, 8, or 28 times a certain uh, uh, baseline concentration, you start seeing these uh, tosal de pointes points. So no longer the atria are controlling the contraction of the ventricles, but there's a dyssynchrony between the atria and the ventricles which can be highly impactful on the performance of the human heart. And we actually quantified those aspects uh, in the paper that I mentioned here. However, we wanted, to we wanted to quantify the risk that each of these different drugs can have on electrophysiology. And I just gave you an example of one drug, and that one drug had an effect on this ion channel. But different drugs can affect all these ion channels. 
So what you would have to do to quantify the risk of all these drugs is make all the possible combinations you can think of. And unfortunately, these models that I showed you here before, these are computationally quite expensive. So what we had to do is work in two stages. And so first we wanted to understand the sensitivity of each possible ion channel block um, on the occurrence of early optical depolarizations. Why early optical depolarizations? Because they're already like a, a lower fidelity hallmark of the risk for arrhythmogenesis. And so what we first do is do a sub to cell scale logistic regression to understand the effects of these different ion channel blockings. So we make we made 10,000 various combinations of all these ion channel uh, blockings that you can that can occur due to certain drugs. And we simulated sex specific mid wall cell behavior because there are important sex differences between male and female hearts. And so you can see here that in the in both male and female uh, mid wall cells, that for certain combinations, you can see early off depolarizations forming. So we wanted, under, we wanted to understand which of these blockings had these effects. And by looking at the normalized marginal effect of this logistic regression that we trained on this, we saw that the rapid delayed rectifier ion channel blocking is the most proarrhythmic, while blocking the L5 calcium ion channel actually is more antiarrhythmic. So that is actually the two most important ion channel blockings to look at. And so then we wanted to scale this up. So we want to understand how blocking these two ion channels has an effect on the whole heart, basically. And if we want to do this, uh, we can naively start sampling within this parameter space and basically quantify what the risk for each combination is. However, to fill this whole parameter space, that's just impossible because of the computational costs of this, uh, this kind of model, as you can see here. So we had to do something else. And what we did here is multi-fidelity Gaussian process classification. So I already explained to you Gaussian process regression. Um, so with multi-fidelity Gaussian process regression, the question that we have, so high fidelity models are costly but accurate. We love them, they are accurate, but they do have some limitations in the computational power that we have to compute each and every one of them. So you can imagine if you want to quantify high fidelity results in a certain parameter space, you can take some samples, so these black dots here, for example, but taking more to really um, limit the amount of uncertainty in regions where you have not sampled will be costly. On the other hand, we can also think of lower fidelity models, for example, as I did showed already with the cell type, uh, cell scale uh, sensitivity, they're less accurate, but they're cheap. And for those models, of course, taking more samples is way easier, and you can train a Gaussian process on these samples as well. The question then becomes, okay, but how can we use this in our high fidelity space? And so the question is, can we use the low fidelity results to help us explore the parameter space? And as a matter of fact, we can. So what you, how you have to imagine this working is that you have your lower fidelity uh, surrogate model that you train here on the low fidelity results, which are cheap. You can take, uh, you can produce way more of these than of the high fidelity space. And then you use this results to actually train the surrogate model in your high fidelity space. So your uh, surrogate model basically is a scaling of your low fidelity space plus a bias function. And this bias function you have to learn. Again, that's another Gaussian process, which actually learns the bias between a low fidelity and a high fidelity simulation. Schematically, why do we do this? So imagine this very simple problem. You have a circuit model learned on based on these high fidelity red dot simulations here. And you have no low fidelity uh, samples, so your uncertainty is large. By learning the bias between low fidelity and high fidelity, for example, already with nine, low fidelity uh, results, you can already um, crunch down the uncertainty that you have basically in your high fidelity space. And ideally, of course, you really can do this to the point that with, that, with the same amount of high fidelity simulations, so still five and more low fidelity simulations, you can really limit the uncertainty that you still have on your high fidelity survey form. So that's what we did in this paper that I mentioned to you here before. So we start with training a low fidelity risk classifier on the onset of early off depolarizations, both for male and female cells. And then we learn the bias between that risk classifier and the true high fidelity risk classifier where we start seeing tosadic quantas forming uh, at certain uh, drug combinations. 
So what does this look, does this look like? So we have our low fidelity risk classifier that we need to train. We start first naively, where we take low fidelity samples within this parameter space. We use physics-based model, the cheap ones, so uh, self-scale simulations. And we learn when this is red, that is a risky combination. When it's blue, it's non-risky. And we try to learn this boundary. Then we also use active learning to really explore where this boundary exactly lies. So with active learning, we can find the regions where you really have the jump between risky and uh, non-risky and risky. So that's what you do here. So you find uh, new places to sample where you still run a physics-based simulation, but you do it um, informed. And that allows you to really classify where this boundary lies. So once you have done that, as a result, you can actually already see here, what we do is that we add on top of those low fidelity cross simulations these dots. So you can see here these circular dots are actually high fidelity simulations. They're way more costly, so I don't want to do as many of those as I did of the low fidelity simulations, but I can use them to train the multi fidelity classifier. So at first, again, I naive sample, I took 10 here with that in hypercube sampling, I informed the model, uh, and it starts to look whether or not we have difference between the low and high fidelity. Then with active learning, what we do is that we also, again, try to better understand where this boundary lies. And for those of you who paid close attention, you can see that actually this boundary moved a little bit up in this process. And so the highest bias function was actually found in this region here. So doing this, we did this both for uh, multi-fidelity models of the uh, female um, electrophysiology models where we looked at the drug combinations. And for male models, we can quantify the risky regions uh, sex specifically. So what you can see here is for three different drugs, they all have their own trajectory within the space. And for certain drug drugs, we had uh, a risk for both men and women, but you saw that the risk uh, was higher for women or at least at lower concentrations. For certain um, medium risk drugs, the men had no risk, while the women still had a risk at a certain concentration. And then for low, um, low risk drug, we, we confirmed this with our models and our classifier uh, based on the results here. So in conclusion, uh, let's focus on today's talk about physics-based modeling and machine learning synergies in human heart modeling. I hope you appreciate the, how we can use physics-based modeling and machine learning uh, because it offers us important opportunities for uncertainty quantification, uncertainty propagation, sensitivity analysis, and hypothesis testing. And so I gave you specific examples of all these techniques that I mentioned here by focusing on these two specific papers here in which we used all these techniques to help us explore sensitivities, confidence intervals, uncertainties, propagate them through our models, make sure that we have a stochastic uh, outcome that is uh, taking into account the uncertainty on our inputs. And we have done, uh, after those papers, we have applied it to many more papers, uh, which I encourage you to take a look at if this is uh, of interest to you. And just to give you uh, some, um, some more understanding that it is not only valid, of course, for human heart modeling, but physics-based modeling in general, we have also applied this to other fields, for example, for, to the brain, we use this to better understand the progression of neurodegenerative diseases, for example, uh, in Al Alzheimer's disease, what the top propagation is. We have used uh, the same for quantifying uncertainty through um, the outbreak dimensions, uh, dynamics of COVID, for example, when we had a lot of data, we had physics-based models, but there was uncertainty in the data, and those also needed to be propagated through our models uh, to better understand the um, risk for um, big outbreaks of COVID. So with that, I would like to uh, conclude uh, my talk today. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now or also uh, later online. Um, and a quick uh, announcement, uh, we have currently also have for people interested in these topics, a uh, PhD and a postdoc vacancy open in our group. So if you know a good candidate or you're very interested in this and want to work on it, this, let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias, for a great talk. Thank you very much, Matthias.
was a, a really impressive uh, and, uh, and, and uh, great uh, presentation. Very clear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, there is a fast question. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, just a reminder for everyone, you can send the questions uh, using the question panel, and then we can read them to the speaker. Uh, the first question is actually not really oriented to the content, but uh, is if we can have access to the slides. Um, I just want to remind everyone that the presentation will will be, I mean, has been recorded and will be uploaded to the Jotos channels. Um, while we wait for uh, more questions to come, uh, maybe we can launch a fast poll. Just to, to fill the time <laughs> when people send some questions. And then we will make some. I also want to thank you again, Matthias, because I know we always say thank you for Bernard's presentation, but it was really nice. I have really enjoyed it and it certainly was very, very didactical. And, and yeah, that, that is was the not goal. Something... I want to yes. say some of these techniques a little bit better because I just looking at equations, it's not always straightforward to understand them. So I hope uh, the schematic slides were useful. Okay, I will close the poll now. Uh, let's see if we have some questions. Okay, uh, Gianluca, do you want to ask something? Uh, yes, I have uh, a question, Matthias. And uh, um, before, uh, at the beginning, uh, um, when, when um, at the beginning of presentation, there were uh, the, the different uh, multi-physics solver, uh, mm -hmm. mechanics, uh, growth uh, modeling, and uh, fluid mechanics, uh, electrophysiology. So um, how uh, do you manage uh, this? Uh, uh, this solver by uh, an informatic point of view, uh, how do you do you exchange the data between these different parts uh, related to different physics? Yeah, so I, I would say that we give a lot of insights into um, this. Maybe let me bring back up the specific slides um, here. So. We talk a lot about how we combine these different physics um, in computational frameworks in our review paper, where we uh, nicely summarize how we solve the electrophysiology, the mechanics, the fluid mechanics. For us, I mean, I know there's a lot of solvers out there. I work very uh, closely together with Abacus. So we have been working uh, on yeah. solving electrophysiology in Abacus. We have been solved, of course, mechanics is, is also what Abacus is known for. And then for the fluid mechanics, uh, we work together with Copfidia, who has their own fluid mechanics solver, and then they have an API or like a, basically an exchange of um, between Abacus uh, and their fluid mechanics solver to, to really solve this. Um, but so the electrophysiology and mechanics is, is completely in Abacus. Uh, the fluid mechanics, uh, Abacus is also working on their own um, fluids uh, solver, of course, and they have been making big strides since this paper came out, I would say. Um, but uh, yeah, the examples I showed you till then were done by uh, having two software packages talk to each other. Ah, okay, okay. So, okay. Uh, th thank you, thank you. Um, there is a question from the audience, uh, from, uh, apologies if I don't pronounce your name correctly, from uh, Sorab uh, Yafalpur. Uh, uh, well, first, they, uh, they thank the speaker for this brilliant presentation, uh, which I agree. And then the question is, um, I have used ML in risk assessment of uh, atherosclerotic, atherosclerotic, well, sorry, <laughs> atherosclerotic plagues. Uh, however, your approaches are very fascinating. Have you applied this approach to uh, atherosclerotic plague as well? Uh, no, we have not specifically. I mean, I have a colleague who works of, uh, on this topic as well, uh, and I think that's also a very relevant um, application that we could think of for using this. Sorry, that should not be here. Um, 
I would say in general, all these these frameworks are applicable to to any problem you throw at them. That's the nice that's the nice thing about it, um, and that's also a little bit what I wanted to convey with with the message on this slide here. We've used it for hard modeling, for arterial modeling uh, in the past as well. So I think uh, here at the this paper, for example, we un quantified uncertainty of wall thickness and stiffness in an idealized aorta to understand. Um, how it grows and remodels and what the certainties are that we even have on this. You can also apply this to flex. We have applied it to brain, we have applied it to COVID, so they're very general for you to use. Um, so yes, I would, I, I'm 99.99% I'm confident that they can be very useful for uh, this, um, this application as well. So if you have used machine learning techniques already before, for example, if you have used uh, neural networks, they typically tend to be more deterministic, of course. Uh, that's why we, uh, in these works, had some preference for using Gaussian processes, because they also take into account the uncertainty. But there are also neural networks nowadays with, uh, with some uncertainty on the rates as well that you can use. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's always uh, a nice challenge to apply them to other applications, but I'm very confident they can be useful. There is another question uh, from Camilo Perez. Uh, he first apologized because he joined uh, a little late. Um, um, and the question is, do you have to train previously a lot of finite element models, for example, in Abacus, to generate data to train machine learning models? That, well, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's, that's some approach you can take. Um, but I, I hope what, uh, the second example uh, of today gave uh, to to you all. Let's see if I can go back to this uh, slide. Yeah, here. So what we wanted to do is not just train a lot of or run a lot of uh, fine element analysis simulations. I think this is a slide I really want to refer to, because what you can also indeed uh, go back to this slide before I just explain the multiplicity. You can also just create like really fill this parameter space with a lot of samples. You don't have to fill it completely and then train a surrogate model on the whole space um, if that is of interest to you. But in our case, we wanted to understand the, the, class, the classification boundary. So we don't really care about samples that are definitely gonna be risky or definitely gonna be safe. We wanted to be informed in how we take samples. So that's in that way, it's more of a staggered approach. So rather than just uh, naively training a surrogate model on the whole space, we were looking for something specific. And with the multifidelity on top of this is what I wanted to convey with that, is that you don't always need a ton of high fidelity simulations if there is some way you can also use low fidelity simulations, for example, that are partially informative. You can think of uh, multifidelity in mul multiple ways, uh, by the way, as well. Like here we thought of it as we only solve part of the, the scales and then the whole, the whole multi-scale problem, but that can also be uh, different uh, geometrical simplifications of your domain, for example, different mesh sizes. There's various kinds of multi-fidelity tasks you can have uh, behind, behind this. Uh, so it's, it is applicable to all these kinds of, uh, of, of uh, ideas. I hope that was informative. Thank you for the long, um, yeah, long answer. There is a second question, um, and the question is: Could you dimension, uh, yeah, could dimensionality reduction algorithms be used to reduce the computational cost as well? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, that that was really the goal of 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 what we wanted to do. We knew beforehand that we would never have been able to fill that whole space, and so this way uh, we can make the most of each sample, and we can make an informed decision on which sample we are going to evaluate. Uh, so that's really, yeah, the short answer is yes. Uh, there is one more question, maybe the final one, um, but if someone wants to send the last one, that's, now is the chance. Um, the question is, um, okay, the question is from uh, Tahar Arjune, and the question is uh, reads, uh, I am interested to know which material model of the passive mechanical behavior of the myocardium will uh, Dr. Painley use? And also thank yeah. you for the interesting presentation. Thanks for that question. And I actually have the perfect answer listed uh, on this slide. 
because we recently used um, constitutive neural networks to discover the most optimal model for myocardial tissue. And so this paper uh, is currently already out as a preprint, uh, it recently got accepted, so I expect it also to um, uh, be published in Computational Methods of Applied and Mechanical Engineering very soon. But this paper is really about that. So uh, together with Denisa Martinova, Kevin Linka, Gerhard Holzhoff, Sigurd Leindecke, and Alan Kuhl, we really looked into that specific problem. It's not an easy problem, but we found a really elegant solution to it and uh, found a new model. Uh, that best explains the data. Um, there are some other comments. Thank you for your presentation. I, I agree because it's very impressive. And there's also one last comment. I think it's Kat. So my interpretation is that it's also, uh, well, they thank you also for the generalization on the uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning based modeling approaches as compared to physics based model. It was indeed a very nice overview, so indeed. Thank you again. Oh, I think there was just one more as I close it. Uh, yes, one more. And maybe that's the last one we take. Um, on the material modeling, have you performed a stability analysis on the mathematical models? Um, I'm not sure if I completely understand the question. So uh, if this is a follow-up yeah, so to the previous I, question, so we, we, yes. uh, we are solving, of course, uh, uh, a highly non-convex optimization problem. So you have to do some regularization. Uh, but if you want to have more details about that, I really uh, strongly advise you to take a look at this paper and also basic, uh, and also this paper because we also did punish for brain tissue. Uh, where we nicely explain this. And we also even have a separate citation, uh, I know, in this paper, uh, where we uh, focus specifically on all these regularization techniques that you need to use to um, solve this problem and find a sparse yet descriptive material model. Okay, I think that's the questions for now. So, yeah, I also encourage strongly encourage everyone uh to take your work I, I i assume that by taking it we can also learn more all the details and, and how to apply it ourselves to our models so i think that's all uh Gianluca, i don't know if you have something uh, else to add yes laura uh, i have just a, a last curiosity for matthias and um, thank you again for the presentation impressive and um uh, I'm thinking to the dig digital twin concept and also the, mm -hmm. the, the research activities on this, uh, on this field. And uh, your work uh, is very, very, very um, quite, uh, quite close to the digi uh, it's a digi digi digital twin of the human heart. And uh, what are the next steps uh, to have this uh, kind of uh, digital twin model uh, in a clinical context uh, in uh, in hospital, uh, for example, uh, what do you think? Uh, what are the main steps, next steps, and, uh, and how many years uh, will uh, need, it, we will need to have uh, uh, such a technology in a clinical context? Those the questions are always hard uh, with respect to how many years. What I can say is that, um, of course, it's nicely. There's the virtual human twin initiative currently. Um, developing by the European Union. And uh, we are actually also part of this. So there's a, a Horizon Europe project called VITAL, and that is also connected to one of the PhD vacancies that I mentioned here. Uh, we're gonna really try to accomplish exactly this challenge. So within the next five years, we really want to bring this technology to the patient, to the clinic, for the clinicians to use, to inform, help them inform their decision-making even more than they currently are able to with pure imaging and uh, clinical data. Uh, the challenges uh, are everywhere, basically. I would say there's, there's gonna be a lot of work in trying to find uh, how complex your physics-based model needs to be for the specific application in mind. I don't think we will find a general digital twin that can be used for anything. I think we're gonna have to 
uh, optimize it for each specific application that we're going to look at. That's going to be different, for example, here, like uh, looking at uh, the risks of drugs that requires other kinds of models than, for example, looking at mechanical failure of, of pacemaker leads. So it's going to be very specific to that and a lot of sensitivity analysis needs to be run to understand which kind of physics-based model we will need and then depending on how costly it is, uh, how can we use data-driven modeling techniques like I showed today to make sure that it's computationally and clinically feasible within a, an appropriate time scale. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. So, so, so Laura, yes, uh, I think that uh, we can close uh, uh, yes. the, the presentation. Okay. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining us today. Again, thank you to Matthias, it was really nice. I'm actually looking forward to watch the presentation myself again, uh, to, to, to look at all the details that, you know, with the, with the, the things on the diary to, to my to my loose, but luckily we have a recording to rewatch again. Um, and yeah, um, I guess that if anyone has something else to ask, they can also contact you. Yeah, there were, I think, some extra comments, but perfect. So thank you, everyone. Um, and see you in the next uh, series of the ESV webinar. Thank you all. Bye bye.